so we have a lot to cover today and this meeting is being recorded. All of the sessions will be recorded. So if you miss one, uh, we will send it out to you afterwards um, so you can watch it at your leisure. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Kidd. She is a retired professor of international relations and someone who loves to stir up good trouble in the Berkshires and beyond. She is the chair of our University Day Committee here at OLLI. Um, and this, this course was originally developed to be a University Day, a day-long in-person um, event but that was scheduled for April of last year. So over the past year, we decided, you know, we waited and watched and then we decided to turn it into an online class. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Catherine Kidd. Hey, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to this class. And um, we always love to meet each other in person and share conversation, uh, but we're thrilled uh, to have so many people in the class and um, that people from all over the country could join us uh, for this class. Uh, we will be taking questions um, for the last half an hour to 45 minutes. We can go 15 minutes over our, um, th our three o'clock stop time. Uh, so if we have a lot of questions, we can do that. Uh, I encourage you to put your questions in the chat, even if, you, uh, even if we don't get to them, it's very helpful for us to have that transcript of the chat to see uh, what kinds of questions people are asking. Uh, so uh, just put those in as they arise uh, during Tom's presentation. Our presenter today is um, Dr. Tom Garrity, uh, and uh, we are very lucky to have him uh, as one of our residents uh, in the greater Berkshire area. Uh, he comes with um, wonderful teaching experience. Uh, he just taught a course for us on Ruth Bader Ginsburg and in the fall, of course, on constitutional law during COVID. Uh, so Ali members are very familiar with Tom and um, his deep knowledge of the constitution. Um, he has both a JD and a PhD from Yale University. Uh, he was president of both Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut and Amherst College uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, he uh, was the executive director of the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University uh, for many years. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Tom and uh, we'll uh, get going with our presentation. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, everybody else, including the Massachusetts Humanities Council for doing this. I have a little, little laryngitis, as you may hear, and uh, write a note if you think I'm not clear in what I say. I'm out in a yurt in uh, Los Angeles where, one of, where our second of four sons uh, live, and that's the background with the skylight that you see is the uh, rounded uh, fretwork, I guess you'd call it, in wood of the yurt. So uh, I guess I should start with a little serious note because uh, the uh, two mass killings that we've had of the, in the Asian spas in uh, Atlanta and now this morning's news carries this uh, awful grocery store shooting uh, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, begin, it br brings us all a kind of seriousness and sobriety. It's been, I think a year or so since uh, the last of these uh, mass shootings uh, and uh, a note of uh, just the imperfection, I guess you'd say of American society and its uh, attachment to guns and some violence. And at the same time, of course, the uh, present administration is in what I think it hasn't quite called a crisis on the border as uh, children and families, uh, especially from Central America, suffering from all sorts of challenges, uh, including the aftermath of the terrible hurricanes, uh, make their way to the border in hopes that this administration will be kinder and more open 
than the last. And of course, overwhelming uh, all sorts of facilities and resources and testing the will of the administration to be uh, generous and humane. Uh, anyway, on that note, uh, I want to say with a giggle uh, that I'm opening this uh, six part series on women's suffrage, slightly embarrassed to be a man. <laughs> and I, 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 as you see in my picture on the first slide, I uh, took the Susan B. Anthony Square in Rochester, and we're trying to find out who did this Tea Party uh, set of statutes of Frederick Douglass, one of the great, great uh, advocates of suffrage, actually. I mean, of course, a, a great, great man in, his, in every possible way as a writer and leader and so on, but uh, an escaped slave, an, an abolitionist, a, crit, crit, a critic of Abraham Lincoln. But there they are having tea, as and they were uh, friends, much as they uh, split. I've noted on the side that he was one of the few men at the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, and in 1869, at the Equal Rights Convention in New York City, he effectively uh, split with Susan B. Anthony and others by saying that black suffrage, 1869, is right before uh, the Civil Rights Amendments fundamentally changed the federal relationship between the states uh, and the federal government uh, over the issues that we had fought the Civil War over, namely uh, the condition of Black Americans. And uh, that angered uh, Anthony and many, many others, and it led to uh, important splits within the suffrage movement. But he says in 1888, as he looks back on it, that he doesn't feel like taping up more than a very small space because it's a women's convention. This is the International Women's Convention. And he thinks as a man, he should be cherry of, uh, of being too present, if you will. And I, I have a little bit of that feeling, much as I don't uh, want to compare myself to the great Frederick Douglass. Now I'm going to start, uh, Catherine, I'm going to try to, okay. So I'm going to start here. Uh, and I don't know if you can see, it looks like I've gotten this slide a little bit uh, oversized, but this is Senator Mike Lee of Utah on October 7th, 2020 saying, we're not a democracy. And this uh, leads to the question, well, if we're not a democracy, what the devil are we? And the argument about uh, a republic versus a democracy, which has uh, gained a kind of currency now, particularly on the right of American politics, uh, I think is a good way to understand the sort of partial truth in what uh, Mike Lee is saying, particularly if he had been speaking in 1795 or some such. Uh, the framers, as I think most of you realize, but certainly including Madison and Hamilton and Washington and most of the rest, but not all, feared mobs and mob mobocracy, uh, French revolutionary kind of activity, just as their classical uh, teachers had, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Cicero, all of the classical Roman and Greek uh, political philosophers were extremely dubious about uh, democracy as leading to dictatorship and excess. And the framers clearly as a, as a majority in the convention in Philadelphia and later on in the Federalist debates wanted standards for voting and what some people on the right, including some quotes in the paper in the last couple of weeks have said, good voters, not bad ones. Well, what were good voters? Uh, well, good voters were generally understood to be the freeholders. In other words, males who were independent and had property, not males who were indentured or servants for others. And they'd be, as it says here in, uh, in a quote from Madison, the safest depositories of Republican liberty. Uh, and, and I say they're wise, informed, experienced representatives, judges, presidents, or as Senator Lee of Utah explained himself in a, a kind of Trumpian misspelling that you see there below in his, uh, his follow-up tweet, <clears throat> democracy isn't the objective, liberty, peace, and what he called, what he wrote, prosperity are, prosperity are. We want the human condition to flourish. Rank democracy can thwart that. If there's ever a modern sentence from the Senate in the spirit of Plato's, say, skepticism or Aristotle's or Cicero's, that's it. 
rank democracy is a problem. In other words, uh, democracy, I think as most of us would understand it for all adults. There's a wonderful quote from Ben Franklin at the time of the convention about a jackass that some of you will have seen before, but I'll read it to you now. Today, a man owns a jackass worth $50 and he's entitled to vote. In other words, he has enough property. But before the next election, the jackass dies. The man in the meantime, meantime has become more experienced, his knowledge of the principles of government and his acquaintance with mankind more extensive. And he is therefore better qualified to make a proper selection of rulers. But the jackass is dead and the man can not vote. Now, gentlemen, pray inform me in whom is the right to vote in the jackass or the man? Uh, just a lovely way to mock uh, the property qualifications that were absolutely uh, typical and uh, nearly universal at the time of the framing. That handsome fellow in a wig on the right in your picture is William Blackstone, the arguably the greatest William, uh, English jurist or uh, lawyer of them all. And I wanted to get this idea that uh, many scholars of voting have written about, namely the idea of dependency. If you ask what's the logic of this limiting of the franchise, not just to males, but to males uh, who have some property and standing in the community, independency and dependency seem to be the logic behind it chiefly. There are other aspects, but I think that's the main thing. And so I pulled out a quote from the Commentaries on the Laws of England. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. Yet there are some instances, of course, in which he's separately considered as inferior to him and acting by his compulsion. And this, uh, you know, nakedly chauvinistic and uh, male supremacist attitude, the, the femme covert, as they say in uh, Anglo, Anglo, in Anglo Latin uh, or Anglo French, really, legal uh, arguments, is part and parcel of what's going on here. The woman is incorporated into the man's legal status. And in a sense, she's represented by him. And thus utterly, the, the, these guys had, uh, it seems to me, really no sense that they should have women uh, voting or women participating in the way, way that uh, men would. And indeed among men that you had to be an independent man. This is from the first, arguably the first constitution in uh, the United States, the Connecticut uh, General Orders. Uh, and they don't actually make any statement about women, but they do say, as I note in number five, uh, voting by individual freemen. Uh, but it's a, in many ways a very forward and, and progressive document, secret paper ballots. Uh, and yet with respect to independence and dependency with respect to women and men, uh, much as it doesn't say anything about that, it seems to be very uh, traditional. So I would say that a, a way to conceive of how things were at the framing of the Constitution is that women were, in a sense, invisible, unmentioned in, all the, in almost all the discussions. And differentiating uh, women from men enslavement and race were simply gotten around with circumlocutions and evasions. They, there was clearly an embarrassment about that among not just Northerners, but many of the framers, I think including Jefferson and Madison. And I just have as an almost as a joke, the fact that as you many of you know, Mary Catherine Goddard of Baltimore was in fact the printer and she got her name on the bottom of the document uh, printed in Maryland by Mary Catherine Goddard herself. Uh, a slave owner who manumitted her slaves, very few at death. There's this wonderful remember the ladies quote, and uh, it's very well enacted here at the, uh, in uh, American Historical Theater uh, by this Kim Hanley. And I just wanna play that for you. It'll take a minute, but it's a lot of fun. And I think she does a good job about bringing together some of the letters of, uh, of our friend, uh, now is that showing up? Yeah, here it is. 
Dear Abby Adams, what were you thinking when you said, remember the ladies? Signed, Disinterested Distaff. Dear Disinterested Distaff, when I married in 1765, I ceased to be Miss Abigail Smith and became Mrs. John Adams. At that time, all of the property that I brought into the marriage became the property of my new husband. During many of the years of our marriage, John was frequently far from my side. During this time, management of his financial affairs fell primarily to me. Whether it was managing the farm or determining parcels of land to purchase or sell, collecting debts owed to his law practice, or even through purchasing public securities. My efforts greatly improved his financial situation. According to the laws under which I live, a legislation for which I as a woman bear no suffrage and laws therefore which are imposed upon me, all of my efforts for family improvement are in John's name only. Under these same laws, I am considered as much John's property as is 40 acres of land or a desk and chair or even a fine fat milk cow. With this in mind, on March 31st of 1776, months before the Virginia Resolution or the Declaration of Independence were adopted by Congress, I wrote to my husband, I long to hear that you've declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and to be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by laws in which we have no voice or representation. I think that's uh, exactly what I want. Are you still there? Have I got my uh, presentation up, Catherine? Catherine? I got you muted. You're good. Okay, good. Uh, the, the great line there is not so much remember the ladies, which is wonderful, then that's the one that's always, but this thing, all men would be tyrants if they could. And uh, I will confess that I think there's, I mean, I guess that's in a way the great constitutional insight that all of us, unless checked with checks and balances and restraints, uh, could exploit others, including uh, others of a different uh, sexual preference or sex. And we do it in, in our intimate relationships as well as in our public relationships. So let me, I'm trying to get on this page. I wanna move on and I wanna pay a little um, homage, especially for those of you who live or have roots in Massachusetts to the great mum bet who took the name Elizabeth. She was named Elizabeth, but Elizabeth Freeman when slave. She was born on the New York side uh, of this region that the Berkshire Community College serves and this Ollie a community it uh, embraces to Dutch farmers. And of course the Dutch farmers lived under a different regime and frankly a less libertarian one in this regard than uh, the Massachusetts farm people. And uh, she went with one of the daughters of the farmer as a bride's gift to Sheffield where she was badly treated. Anytime, anytime while I was a slave, she said, if one minute's freedom had been offered to me and I'd been told I must die at the end of that minute, I would have taken it just to stand one minute on God's earth, a free woman. I would. And uh, during this period, uh, just before 1780, she heard talk in a, of, an, of inalienable rights and the Massachusetts Constitution, which was to hold that all men are born free and equal. And notice that all men again, uh, probably referring to all of us people in America, but clearly uh, not making mention of women and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and fine that of seeking and obtaining safety and happiness. So she went to a neighbor lawyer named Tyler Sedgwick, an ancestor of Kira Sedgwick, to bring suit, 
and she got the help of law teacher Tapping Reeve, uh, who is uh, in Litchfield, who is seen by many as the founder of Yale Law School. <clears throat> and she goes to him and says, I heard that paper read yesterday that says all men are created equal and that every man has a right to freedom. I'm not a dumb critter. Won't the law give me my freedom? And notice that she's interpreting that word man to include woman. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1781 agreed with her and gave her 30 shillings of damages to her and another person who had been enslaved in Sheffield. And she uh, is said to have lived out her life in just happiness in her lawyer's household and was buried in the family plot. And those of you who hike on that Bartholomew's cobble and see the uh, house of uh, the Ashley house, I think it's called, uh, we'll see that there's a plaque uh, to Mum Bet, uh, an extraordinary person who performed an extraordinary act of courage and uh, litigation in winning her freedom under the new uh, Massachusetts constitution. And she, by the way, is born in the very same year as Abigail Adams. So the right to vote, a, a kind of shocking thing to any of us who pay attention to our feelings about the United States and our ideas is that you can't really find, that you cannot find the right to vote in the constitution and really all the amendments. You find instead a bar to certain things and I put up here control F because on my Mac, if you put control F and I can do that now, if I go to the constitution, you can search for different terms. So if you can see my screen now, do you see that Catherine, the constitution of the United States? Is that up yes, on the Yes, we've got it. Yeah, I'm gonna enlarge it and I'm just gonna do command F and put in uh, in quotes, right to vote, and you'll see that nothing comes up. Zero. And then I can put in, uh, well, I'll, I'll cut right to the chase and say, let's put in mail, because there are three references to mail. They're very late, uh, but they come in the 14th Amendment, and you can see that they're marked there in section two, which I put the cursor on, which talks about the apportioning uh, of representatives among the several states according to the numbers, counting the whole numbers of in each state and excluding Indians not taxed. And in, uh, Native Americans had to wait until the 1920s uh, in the Native American Voting Act to actually be uh, seen as full-fledged citizens of the United States as opposed to uh, members of tribes who would somehow have their uh, all their governing authority uh, encapsulated within the tribe. But as you go down here on the line, you'll see any of the male inhabitants. Now, what that refers to is that if a given state after the Civil War were to deny any of the male inhabitants, being 20, 21 years old of age and citizens, uh, abridging their right to participate, then that would reduce, it wasn't that it was banned, it would simply reduce the uh, voting representation uh, of that state uh, in Congress. And uh, if you go down then to the 15th Amendment in the, the Civil War amendments are generally considered the 13th abolishing slavery, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime. And that's seen nowadays that punishment for crime deprivation of uh, the of, uh, as not slavery, and that bears on the question of voting because many people think that uh, the felon disenfranchisement of people who've been convicted of a crime is a new Jim Crow. Uh, and coming down though, to, we had the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments all responsive to the victory of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. The, the 13th abolishing slavery, the 14th declaring that whatever your state may say, if you're born here and naturalized here, you're a citizen of the United States entitled to the rights and privileges as well as the due process of citizens and residents. And then the 15th, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state. This is the second revolution, the federalist system of letting the states and states rights control gives way after the civil war formally and legally. Uh, to a notion of national citizenship that cannot be abridged. 
on account of race, color, or previous condition. But with respect to women's suffrage, it's very clear in the 14th Amendment that it's males who are the bearers of this uh, freedom, this new set of rights, and not females. And we have to wait all the way until our 19th Amendment in 19, I mean, our 20, our, in 1919, uh, the right of the citizen of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the U.S. or by any state on account of sex. And the same formula, formulation, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, such as by Title IX. Um, so if that's clear, the, the main point I'm making in this slide is that we think of ourselves as a full-on democracy in which uh, the right to vote is foundational. And yet uh, we didn't come at it that way. And there are many ways in which it doesn't today uh, truly obtain in that sense. Federalism, <clears throat> in other words, the, the constitution formed by a federation or federalism among the states has left a lot of power in the states, left an enormous power then, was revised by the Civil War uh, formally and by the Civil War amendments, but it still persists and I think in a sense can be said to haunt us today uh, under, just to take one phrase in the Constitution uh, from the 10th Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights, the powers not get delegated, not given explicitly to the US by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. And that reservation to the states is still something that comes up in litigation over voting rights today as we fight about state rules about such things as registration, registration, identification, residence, and so on. And I'll go into that in greater length in a minute. There's a, a slide with the Civil War amendments again. And uh, I don't really need to repeat all this because I just read it to you, but I just want to be clear. So 1865, the abolition of slavery following uh, the Civil War, 1868, again, in the sort of trail of the Civil War, uh, the guarantee of equal protection of the laws and due process, but the mention of male inhabitants as the explicit bearers of these rights. And uh, the 15th Amendment, uh, when finally, uh, the abolitionists and the radical Republicans and others in Congress could get the states, push the states to accept the idea that nobody was to be denied the right to vote. No male was to be denied the right to vote on account of race, color, or enslavement previously. <coughs> All of you, I, I for many years have taught terrorism and counterterrorism and the constitutional relation to it. And I think it's worth saying as we discuss what happened in Atlanta in particular, that the United States <clears throat> in its history of Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan and so on really has been the classic site of domestic terrorism for a long time, certainly since the Civil War and arguably before it. So we had this conferral in the Civil War amendments, this second revolution that changed our federal system and said, it's a federal system, there are states' rights, but you can no longer deny certain basic human rights to uh, citizens of your state who happen to be uh, African-American. And black voting and freedom, as all of you I think know, became for so many years a dead letter. Reconstruction itself, arguably just like, certainly less than a decade, the Knight Riders and the Ku Klux Klan attacks and massacres and the faltering Republican will, uh, President Grant's just despair that he couldn't do much about it. Uh, the Democratic Party, which was a Dixiecrat party at that point, uh, left freed African-American subject to all sorts of horrors, lynching, poll taxes, expropriation of small gains and property and so on, businesses. And the white supremacist South really won the peace uh, despite these Civil War amendments and reactionary courts, including the Supreme Court, gutted many of the efforts by the Congress to guarantee enforcement uh, and high principles, in other words, but little real force. 
Now, it may be a stretch, but I think it's fair to draw a line from that pure period of horror to the Shelby County decision in 2013, in which discrimination, in my view, and I think many of the views of many of us, including, of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg was protected or sheltered behind a reasserted idea of federalism and state sovereignty and states' rights. I, when I was preparing this, I realized I didn't really know what Shelby County is. And you can see, I did a screenshot of my Google Maps of Birmingham and the red outline there is Shelby County. And when you look up its demography, it's mostly white uh, with about an eight or nine or 10% uh, population of African-Americans. And I suspect some uh, other populations uh, from Asia and elsewhere, but but minor. And it votes a hard line uh, right side of the fence uh, in the last few years, very Republican county. But it's the county that brought suit, challenging the major uh, enforcement portion of the uh, Voting Rights Act. And Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, and I think it's worth looking at this to draw that line between uh, Jim Crow and state sovereignty uh, in the post-Civil War period. So Roberts says in the lines that I have there for you, the Voting Rights Act employed extraordinary measures for an extraordinary problem. And section five of the act required states to obtain federal permission before enacting any law related to voting. And then look what he says, and, and I have it in red, a drastic departure from basic principles of federalism. Section four of the act applied that requirement only to some states, an equally dramatic departure from the principle that all states enjoy equal sovereignty. And then he goes on to say, this was strong medicine. Congress determined it was needed. They had an insidious and perverse pervasive evil. Uh, and we, just as Robert says, looking back at past precedents, upheld the law, exceptional conditions justifying exceptional measures. So what the Voting Rights Act did was say that if states fulfilled certain criteria of uh, inequalities in voting, of poll tax practices, literacy practice, and so on, to exclude voters, then they came under a geographic identification of them as problematic states and uh, sections of uh, boroughs of New York City were uh, covered by this as well. And then they would have to get any change, any major change in voting law uh, up, approved, pre-approved, pre-cleared by uh, the Justice Department. And uh, look at Roberts is in the next paragraph, I've, I've edited this to show you, but he says, well, nearly 50 years after this law was passed, these things are still in effect and now they're more stringent. And now he says they're scheduled to last until 2031. But there's no denying that conditions that originally justified these measures no longer characterize voting in the covered jurisdictions. The racial gap in voter registration is lower or has become lower in the states originally covered than it was nationwide. And there is a racial gap, but he's saying these typically, the chiefly Southern ex-Confederate states have actually caught up with the nation. African-American voter turnout has come to exceed white voter, voter turnout in five of the six states originally covered by, and then he overthrows what Congress had done. Uh, this is the action that Ruth Bader Ginsburg described as uh, you're in a rainstorm and you've got an umbrella, so you're not getting wet. So you toss the umbrella saying, I'm dry. And of course, that's exactly what happened. We got, we, we got <coughs> immediately following this decision, a whole raft of exclusions and restrictions, and identity requirements, uh, not just in the covered states, but through, it, it, it was a kind of infection and uh, elsewhere too. And as you all know, we're getting a new such rash now in response to the victory of uh, former Vice President Biden to become President of the United States as he is now. Well, after the Civil War amendments passed, there were all sorts of things going on in the country to put the uh, recently emancipated black people in a situation of inferiority that amounted to near slavery. And I wanted to show you some Thomas Nast 
cartoons because they're very vivid on the question and they themselves show certain kinds of, uh, how would I describe it, of even prejudice in a way. So there you see a cartoon with three people with their feet uh, almost on the neck of a man who seems like a, a Union soldier and who is uh, drawn by Nast to, a, to be a black man. On the left, you see the five points hat. This is a caricature, almost a monkey-like caricature of Irish Americans because of the New York draft riots, because of their well-known prejudices in this period about the Civil War. Many of them, uh, many fought and died, some of my relatives from Ireland, but others were utterly uh, opposed to risking their lives to emancipate black people. And uh, as recent immigrants, they didn't, they resented uh, in, in the working class, they resented labor competition uh, from freed black people. In the middle, you see Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder, the first uh, grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the most notorious uh, war criminals of the Civil War, and uh, a terror really to black people, both during the Civil War and after. And on the right, August Belmont, who was himself an immigrant to the United States, a Ger German Jewish financier, and uh, he actually is depicted in the pretty much the way he actually looked. Uh, the least he and Bedford Forrest get to look sort of uh, regular as opposed to the Irishman. And uh, but uh, no doubt a note of kind of uh, anti Semitism in the uh, Thomas Nass uh, objection to all this, although Nass himself was a very pro abolition, pro uh, liberation uh, cartoonist in his period. Another NAS cartoon shows uh, some kind of rough looking police-like figure driving an American Indian away from the polls. Uh, and his uh, little quotation or his little caption at the bottom uh, says, you know, who's really here first in effect. Um, but the, this is the idea that American Indians, especially those who retain their cultural traditions and remain with their tribes were utterly disallowed from voting until the 1920s. And in the picture, I can't make out quite all the satire there, but it looks to me like there's a Russian immigrant, the Irish guy with a little a patty pipe, uh, just a, a, some financiers. I mean, just the NASA idea that all these guys were ganging up to pick on uh, what we would have called minorities, I guess, a few years ago. <coughs> and I thought another NAS cartoon uh, the Chinese wall around the United States of America, obviously <clears throat> ironizing about the Great Wall of China. But th as those of you like Catherine are from the West know that the Chinese immigrants, mostly males, really built the railroads of the West and built a lot of other things, uh, irrigation, many of the farms and so on in the Great Valleys. Uh, and, and were seen as really with great prejudice in cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and throughout the West. And in 1882, when a lot of this building had its first phase had occurred, a really striking exclusion in uh, racist immigration laws, which lasted for a number of decades, the Chinese Exclusion Act, one of the most famous uh, racist uses of our immigration power in our history. And you see the ladder getting over the wall there says emigration. Um, <clears throat> on the other side, uh, the suffrage movement stirred through this period. And uh, uh, one of its great cases is called, um, is the Virginia Minor case. And I have a picture of there. And she wanted to vote in, 18, in 1875 in St. Louis. and. Uh, litigated it all the way to a unanimous Supreme Court denial. Uh, and Chief Justice Waite uh, said, there's no doubt that women may be citizens. And this is a strange idea. They are persons. So in other words, they're covered by the 14th Amendment and so on. For nearly 90 years, though, the people have acted upon the idea that Constitution, when it conferred citizenship, did not necessarily confer the right of suffrage. And that's an extraordinary statement. And I think very penetrating on the question, was America founded as a true democracy or like Athens and other uh, 
quote unquote democracies in history? Was it really just a, a radically partial democracy with denial? And of course the answer is it was a radically partial democracy in which women were uh, held to somehow be citizens, but under the cover quote unquote of their men and African-Americans and many others, but chiefly African-Americans were altogether excluded along with uh, Native Americans. Uh, a, a cute little footnote here is that the very first women voters sort of snuck through all this uh, so that it is recorded in the Uxbridge town meeting uh, notes uh, from way back in 1756 that there was a voter named Lydia Chapin Taft uh, who voted at a town meeting. And, and that's an extraordinary thing. It shows that there was a good deal of disorganization and inconsistency in this, in the invisibility of women and all this. Uh, and in New Jersey for a good, a little more than a decade until the Democratic legislature took over, Jefferson's party, I should add, uh, a number of single women, widows and so on, and some African-Americans were voting, uh, but it was all thrown out in 1807 uh, in the state legislature. So there was a good deal of variability, but really uh, trivial, I think, in numbers. But the suffrage movement was gaining force. The idea uh, first by this time of the Civil War and thereafter white men didn't were not in almost in any state i think required to have property so that the principle of if you're a citizen you can vote was fully enforced for white men and then out west and it's legendary who knows why but it's legendary that the west was settled by first by like alaska or something by lots of men and they needed women and so on so in Wyoming territory, starting in 1869, we got the first state that said women can vote and it's a territory, not a state. And this great gal here, Esther Hobart McQuig Slack Morris, who as you can see from her name, outlived a bunch of men uh, and was said to be at least six feet tall, uh, was the great negotiator and leader of women's suffrage in Wyoming territory. And then the first justice of peace and some in Wyoming history books, they claim she was the first JP in the whole world, which I put a question mark, I have no idea. Uh, Laramie, meanwhile, the town of Laramie put women on their juries and you got this uh, funny little rhyme, baby, baby, don't get in a fury. Your mother's gonna sit on a jury. Uh, and and it, it was a pretty consistent view in Wyoming, undoubtedly uh, racist in many ways, but when they went for statehood, uh, Congress seemed to hesitate over the women's voting issue, and they notoriously sent a message saying, we won't come in with our, without our women. And I, I wanted to just touch on a few of the other firsts in this battle. Tom, uh, yes. can I interrupt for a second? Uh, when you were toggling back and forth, your screen went smaller. So can you go back to presentation mode? Yes, and let me, and forgive me for doing that. Let's see, where is presentation mode? I confess, I'm not seeing it here. New share, it's sharing, right? Yes, it's sharing. Why is it not showing? I can't figure out why it's not okay. showing. Let's go ahead, let's just go well, ahead. Is that, I made it a little bigger, but I okay, did. Okay, that's good. Yeah, but I don't, I'm not sure why. I think my screen, my, uh, for whatever reason, I forgive. In other words, you're seeing some border from yes. others. Yeah. Okay. That's, 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 me. that's not, now you've got it. Right. So uh, Naomi Anderson on the left, an African-American speaker in California, an agitator, uh, Laura DeForest over on the right, uh, up above, Maria Evangelina Lopez, uh, in California, you got a real movement of power. And uh, Maria Evangelina Lopez, who was one of the first, uh, I think was the first uh, person of Latin background to teach at UCLA, has this wonderful uh, pamphlet there that you see in Spanish, Dese a la Mujer de California, el derecho de votar. And then she gives por qué, why should the uh, Mujer de California, the women of California have the derecho, the right to vote? And she gives a bunch of reasons. She should obey the law like the man. Therefore, she should vote like a man. She should pay her taxes like a man, et cetera. Just a wonderful 
advocacy paper and their English versions of the same yellow sheet that you will see uh, in other states. Uh, a, a great example because it counters the California uh, and Western anti-Asian feeling is uh, Clara Elizabeth Chan Lee, who registers to vote at the Alameda Courthouse in 1911, uh, born like uh, Catherine in Oregon and died as a grand old age of 107 in San Francisco. And there she is with her husband, who was the first dentist uh, in front of the registrar of voters. But there's a dark side to this. So they, neither Congress nor the states were above using some notion of women's voting as a way to abet interests like Jim Crow laws that we would find unacceptable. Uh, and I have a picture of Kate Gordon of New Orleans, who is an outright and arrant white supremacist advocating state voting for women, not federal. Uh, but ag in Louisiana, and uh, but speaking out viciously about uh, this is the only way we'll get a whole bunch of new white voters and we'll keep uh, black people from uh, making any progress in Louisiana. Also, the strange history of uh, women's suffrage in Utah, where, uh, as all of you know, Congress and the federal government and many Americans were very, very suspicious of Mormons and polygamy, uh, a doctrine that the Mormons eventually abandoned under congressional and uh, national pressure. And uh, they, Congress actually wanted Mormon women to vote and, and allowed it, <coughs> but went back and forth. So for 17 years they could vote and then they couldn't because what Congress, what Americans soon learned was that Mormon women were gonna vote like Mormon men for their uh, religious principles and they, voted, they didn't vote to repeal polygamy and it was only under congressional pressure. Uh, that that changed. Now, this dark side, uh, this prejudicial side, in a sense, goes all the way back to Seneca Falls and the 15th Amendment. So <clears throat> Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, of course, joined with Frederick Douglass in 1866 to create the American Equal Rights Association. In other words, advocates of these Civil War amendments uh, to liberate those living in the South, the Confederate States, the formerly Confederate States. And the question arose, who goes first in voting, black men or white women, or should anybody go first? And this became a vexed question uh, with the 15th Amendment. And uh, it unfortunately put some of our greatest uh, women su suffrage strugglers and advocates on the wrong side, if you will, of the race question and, and brought some bitterness into the whole struggle. Uh, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in particular indulged in some awful rhetoric about uh, that I have at the bottom. I'm not gonna read it, but Patrick and so on and Hans and Young Tongue. She really is referring to the Blackstonian idea that the only good voters are voters who are educated in English and so on and so forth, know how to spell uh, all that literacy kind of stuff that became such an important issue. Uh, and, and she compares them to educated, refined women versus the lower orders of men. Um, and maybe this is just another example of so many of the things we're seeing in the debates today about people like Lincoln or Washington or Stanton uh, or Anthony who clearly are by our standards, uh, aren't always on the side of good and, and the side of the angels and stray towards prejudice uh, as so many human beings do, uh, especially in passion and under pressure. And this led to a split with Frederick Douglass. There was a wonderful examples like Ida Wells. Uh, and as I put it here, she refuses to go to the back of the parade with a nod towards going to the back of the bus. A wonderful organizer, orator, journalist against lynching, real important person, part of the great migration from the South to Chicago, founder of one of the great black suffrage clubs. And she was going to be excluded from the, <coughs> when suffrage was, women's suffrage was really gaining some momentum from the Washington March, uh, but just took the insult, hung back a bit, and then stepped right forward and marched with Illinois, and nobody dared stop her. And it was a real act of of going to the front of the bus. It was a, a real civil rights act of importance in the suffrage movement. 
<clears throat> so there was this divide between white and black uh, did last through the suffrage struggle all the way up to the ratification of the 19th. But with the 19th Amendment, women, of course, had to vote. But I want to just underscore, and you'll be hearing a lot more of this in the series of lectures here, many women and many men did not yet. First, there was Jim Crow in the South still reigning supreme uh, through the 20th century up to the, the 50s and 60s. There were literacy tests that were used to enforce this. There were poll taxes and they could be accrued if you didn't uh, pay the poll taxes and didn't vote in the last two elections and this time you'd have to pay three times the poll tax. There was the usual intimidation going back to the KKK and so on and now slightly subtler but it, including lynching, burning of homes and businesses and other, uh, how would you describe it, other uh, retaliation for voting or trying to vote. A, an extraordinary feature of our elections in these days in the South was white primaries, uh, particularly in Texas on the theory that a political party is a voluntary association like a club the Democratic Party in Texas for decades said it's a white party and you can't vote in primaries, even though you were guaranteed under the uh, Civil War amendments, your ability as a black man or, or, and ultimately a black woman to vote in the uh, federal elections and so on. There were registration and residency rules uh, that were harsh, just as today we're seeing those revived. Uh, there, were the, there was insistence on full documentation of naturalization, along with literacy and knowledge of the Constitution. And that was a terrible curse for many, many immigrants to uh, the cities of the United States and to, the, to elsewhere, too. And then there was a persistent debate, even up in Maine and other parts of New England, about, well, should dependent or po impo you know, impoverished people who are getting help from the town or whatever, be allowed to vote, which really goes back to this Blackstone theory of dependency. But things were changing and the depression, FDR and the New Deal, and then World War II with black soldiers and so on, the great migration to the Northern cities of African-Americans from the South, all of this shifted America pretty strikingly and radically and we got what many of us consider a kind of third revolution beginning with the civil rights struggle, uh, culminating in the poll tax amendment, which got rid of the poll tax in 64. There was a lot of litigation behind that. Uh, and a question, the Supreme Court said, well, you can get rid of the poll tax for federal elections, but not state in an Oregon case. And uh, the 26th amendment, very much influenced, I think, by the Vietnam War. If young people are dying, for the country, then young people ought to be able to uh, vote in the country. And above all, the most revolutionary things of all were the 64 Civil Rights Act, which we've talked to, you know, all of you are familiar with, and the Voting Rights Act that followed it in 1965, which I, or the key part of which I already read to you in going over Shelby County. These looked to many of us and many of you on this uh, call or Zoom like a revolution that was really embedding itself in American life. And I must say that the Shelby County gutting of the Voting Rights Act in just a few years ago and the various rashes of proposed and now some past restrictions on the theory that there's a fraud going on on voting that we're seeing today give pause in our sense of the progress that we seem to be on the verge of in 64 and 65. Um, the Civil Rights Act itself is, remains, I think, pretty strong, but there's a very good argument that the Voting Rights Act has been gelded, really, has been weakened to the point that it will have very little force going forward. There's an important voting rights case before the Supreme Court this year and its decision will, will govern how we interpret the, uh, the ban on discrimination, but it may well be weakened by this pretty uh, conservative or reactionary Supreme Court that we have. So <clears throat> I wanted to end by saying that really the history of suffrage is a great chapter in our civil rights struggle at large across the world. Who's in, 
who's out, who's heard, who's silenced, who's deprived, who's privileged. Our country was the first country in the world to set up an anti-monarchical government, a republic that overthrew a king. But it didn't really fully set up a democracy, if by democracy, you mean a place where everybody who is an adult, however you count adults, is brought in and given a voice and a vote. So I think this struggle continues now and will continue uh, still. And it leads to a question about what we might say about our constitution and its history. Uh, and I say to you, is it a story of heroes or a story of villains? And I'll just say for myself, I think it's a much more complex story of human beings. We certainly began with worthy ideals of democracy uh, among the first in history, but we began too with very unworthy denials and prejudices and exploitations, cruelties and abuses. And we see in so many venues in the United States now and in around the world that there are sort of two views of our predecessors all the way up through the Civil War amendments and the suffrage amendment uh, that there was racism and sexism all the way through on the one hand, and thus it's condemnable, or that it was a more complex set of compromises with condemnable, awful aspects, but other, uh, others pushing and pulling for emancipation and so on while others resisted them. And I don't mean to answer that question for you. I, I myself think it was a complex uh, matter of human beings like Lincoln uh, who just were not quite living up to Frederick Douglass's, say, ideals, or Susan B. Anthony herself not living up to what you might think of the ideals of feminism and women's suffrage. And finally, I, I wouldn't be completing this lecture without saying something about the ERA. Uh, you, most of you know that for almost for 50 years or so, the language from the 20s on through the 72 uh, was proposed to the Congress as a constitutional amendment to be sent out to the states, but it never garnered the two thirds votes. But finally it did in 72. And uh, curiously and interestingly, they put a seven year uh, deadline on it, uh, a not always consistent thing in proposed constitutional amendments. They varied, some have it, some don't. Uh, but in any case, we didn't get to the required 38 states in time, so it was extended for three years. We still didn't get to the required. And by the time last year that Virginia's legislature voted, uh, the, uh, voted to join the ERA, uh, we had five states saying, well, we voted for it once, but now we want to revoke it. And this is a complicated thing. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually thought maybe uh, we hadn't ratified it. But we have one precedent that says that very clearly it's a political question for Congress. And last week, our Congress, Nancy Pelosi's Congress, voted to accept the ratification. So now it goes to the Senate. And we know, because uh, Lisa Murkowski is a co-sponsor, that some Republicans, maybe not just women, will support it. But we're back uh, at the end of this lecture at the great question of the filibuster. and. Uh, if it takes 60 votes, your guess is as good as mine about whether this uh, ERA will at last pass in the year of these lectures. Uh, and I really do not know. I was sort of trying to count up just on a guesstimate, uh, and I confess I didn't quite get to 60. So if we get to 60, I think the Supreme Court will stay out of it. Uh, but even, but if, and, and it will be a part of our constitution, um, but there's always a risk that they won't, that the, uh, the unpredictable conservatives on the court will say, well, the deadline was serious. You couldn't, you can't get around it, et cetera, et cetera. And I think with that, I'm done. And I want to say thank you all for listening in. I hope it was clear. Uh, and I know there's a huge amount of complication in here and lots of detours. But let's take some time to talk about it. Catherine. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions and comments. Uh, but I would also encourage you, those who have not put questions in as the discussion with Tom continues, uh, please feel free to add those. Uh, so I'm going to start first with information. 
uh, because I'm not sure that everyone could see this. Uh, the sculpture um, in uh, Rochester is by uh, an individual named Peeps, P-E-P-Y-S, Ketavong, K-E-T-T-A-V-O-N-G. So I'm assuming that this person might be Southeast Asian uh, based on the names, which would make it add another layer of interest. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and it happened in the uh, very first uh, part, or the sculpture was put up in the first part of the 20th century. Um, so, uh, Tom, um, there uh, was a comment um, that, and this may go to a broader discussion of different interpretations of the Constitution, but a comment made that uh, if you search the Constitution for the words education or school, they don't appear in the Constitution, although education is clearly one of the critical components uh, for a democracy, as Thomas Jefferson was wont to say. Um, so uh, how do we deal with these questions of what was left out? And how do we think about that? And um, uh, how are the different views from the uh, literalists on the Constitution versus others? Um, yeah. Well, for start, principle number one is it was a Constitution formed to create a country out of some contentious and pretty differentiated colonies or states, right? We got, in other words, our constitution was not like uh, a constitution for some highly unified uh, monarch ruled uh, France, say at the time of the French Revolution. Uh, and that itself was a struggle to get it unified. Ours was, can we form a country? Uh, and there were lots of compromises like the great senatorial compromise where each state, no matter what population gets two senators, uh, Adelia quoted uh, something she saw on CNN or something that some guy in Wyoming, to go, go back to Wyoming, was saying, you know, about DC statehood, that DC may have more people than Wyoming, but out here we got regular people, working class people, the guy said, <laughs> uh, reminding me of, of Sarah Palin's of proclamation that Wasilla was real people. So our constitution was begun with a notion we have to let each of these states go their way. And of course, that's why the compromises were made over slavery. If it had just been a northern country, all, presumably slavery would have been promptly abolished. And you can ask yourself as kind of alternative history whether the South would have gone off in a South, in a, I expect, expect it would have gone off in a South African apartheid kind of direction. So lots was left out. The, the idea was that the states would govern things like education. The states would govern, uh, to take another controversial feminist issue, reproduction. And what happened with the Civil War was that by seceding, Lincoln was pressured into, a, because he was a true, almost religious believer in the Union, he was push, push, push to say, you cannot secede. It's we the people, not we the states. And you cannot do this. You cannot break up the union and thus weaken the United States. And you're doing it over slavery. I've always been against slavery and gradually he was pushed to totally oppose slavery and ultimately before he died to support uh, black soldiering and ultimately a black vote. But it, it is, I think, simply the nature of our constitutional history that it was a minimalist, federalist, let the states do their thing constitution until a sense of injustice and wrongness led to the first great change, which was the Civil War. And then I think it's worth saying that the suffrage movement together with the civil rights movement generally has represented a third great struggle and we ain't out of it. We ain't out of it. It's gonna go on uh, for a long time. If you had told me and Adelia when we met back in the 60s and we're marching and getting arrested and stuff that we wouldn't be out of it when we we're in our 70s, I would not have believed you. I would have said, oh, you've got to be kidding. But we've just come very close to a reactionary coup. Uh, indeed, a few Republicans stopped it. And, 
I, uh, I think, I guess maybe the lesson is democracy is always powerless, is always at risk and you got to fight for it. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and that uh, relates um, to another question in terms of what the rights and responsibilities of citizens are. Um, and um, there was a question um, whether women were considered citizens before the 19th Amendment, and you pointed that out that they were considered citizens. But um, in addition to voting, how did the other rights of citizenship, the right to serve on a jury, the right to serve in the military, uh, how did those get played out after the 20th, um, after the 19th Amendment, 1920? There's a big question that I am not going to be able to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's clearly been, I mean, take the military. You know, I think the selective service still requires males to sign up and females not. Am I not right, Catherine? That is correct. That is yeah. correct. And, I mean, and if men do not sign up, they are not eligible for Pell Grants yeah, to so they're college, and they're not eligible for federally subsidized loans for college. So draft when, registration, non-compliance has very specific monetary uh, penalties associated. For males only. So in that yeah, sense, female sense are in this dubious paternalistic advantage situation, right? They get they're they're strangely advantaged by that. It's a it's this is just an extraordinary phenomenon of social change. Uh, the idea that Title IX would protect a trans people, people uh, who are queer, have different sexual orientations and preferences, and so on. The right, the, the sort of uh, textualist, literalist, originalist attitude on that, they, they were right. The Congress wasn't thinking about that, but the country has changed. And even some of these very uh, conservative to reactionary justices like Gorsuch realized that the change is big enough that something uh, like gay marriage and so on, something like the respect for the civil rights of, of somebody who changes uh, from one sex to the, one of the binary sexes to the other, uh, and shows up for work as a woman where yesterday uh, she was a man. Uh, you know, the, this is social change in action and over many decades. Uh, and some of it is helped along by a court decision. Some of it is helped along by legislation. Uh, but a lot of it is miscellaneous. It just comes hither and yon. And there's kind of gradually acceptance uh, of things have changed and we can't go back. Uh, it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to see if we're going to go back on uh, the right to choose and Roe v. Wade, et cetera. Um, and I think it's just one of those enormously complicated things. We shouldn't revere, I think, the Constitution or our laws so much that we expect them to have all good and morality within them. And we certainly shouldn't revere or respect our judges and justices and legislators so much that we don't uh, keep agitating and criticizing them when they feel they're doing something that's unjust. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there's another question here that will take us in a slightly different direction, uh, and that is besides the Voting Rights um, Act of the mid-1960s, uh, is there other legislation that treated states differently? So when we're thinking about legal challenges to the Voting Rights Act. Well, the, you know, that's a very interesting question. And it, let me go at it in a funny way, Catherine. And that is to say that one of the things that you see in the poll taxes, the literacy tests, the where are your immigration papers kind of discriminations, the how much property you own is under the guise of a neutral criterion, different groups are very differently impacted. So I asked for naturalization papers from you. The other guy says he was born here and I just let him through. Uh, and we're seeing this in so many regards, for instance, in the present rash of attacks on, uh, I think on attacks on democracy, uh, the requirement that you have to have a state issued ID that certain state issues issued ideas work in Georgia and others don't. Uh, the famous distinction between 
the uh, hunting license gets you in and a student ID may not in some states. Um, I think you're, you're, you've got this complicated question of what is treating me differently and what is neutral. Um, I don't offhand, uh, I do think the Voting Rights Act reflecting the Civil War was very much a treating states differently, the rebel states, and then the discriminating uh, states, but they use pretty neutral criteria such that, uh, as I say, some boroughs of New York were included. So I, it's what is treating people differently and what is treating them fairly and differently is a tough, tough question. And uh, I think I stand with the view that uh, measures, explicit objective measures of how states behaved even 50 years ago uh, are a, a fair reason following the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement to treat them a little differently and have preclearance. I think the big thing on the Voting Rights Act is that after Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts announced this decision, we saw a huge uprush, upwelling of uh, changes in voting laws defended on neutrality, but as one federal judge said in North Carolina, aimed with surgical precision at racial groups. And um, so I, I think this is a very tough question, but I, I, I think Roberts has a point, but those who oppose him, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, have another point, which is these states are subject to uh, the need to be governed differently uh, pro tem until they show that they're really being fair. And we're seeing now, uh, I think it's just outright unfairness in the things that are proposed. Hey, thank you. Uh, and that brings us to a related question. Um, and that is, there are a number of people who asked what your vote, what your view is on House Resolution Number One, which is on its has now been introduced in the Senate in its Senate version. Um, and, um, but I'd like to just tag on something in in regard to that that question, and that is that um, in the last couple of elections. Um, women have voted at much higher rates than men, uh, and that African-American women vote at the highest rate of any group in the United States. Um, and so how does, uh, because then that brings a gendered piece into this question of who gets to vote, because white women voted for Trump, African-American women, um, more than any other group voted overwhelmingly uh, for Biden and for Hillary Clinton. Um, so how, what's the gender element in this, um, in the um, House resolution to uh, reassert voting rights? Well, as a matter of fact, and for now, it means that if this uh, surge of restrictions in the various states, part of federalism, uh, go through and are left there, uh, there will be a, an in effect a discrimination or a de facto difference in results hitting older women in particular, because many older, especially black women in the, and especially in the poorer parts of the country, including the South, do not have the ID resources, the travel resources, cars and so on live in rural areas, want to vote on Sunday, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I'm totally for HR1. And I guess despite the risks, I'm pretty much for getting rid of the filibuster. I do myself find it bizarre uh, that people have come to say the filibuster is the heart of the Senate when it has nothing to do with the uh, original frame of the constitution or any later amendments. It is purely uh, a rule that was cooked up chiefly by segregationists uh, to stop things like abolishing the electoral college or extending the franchise fairly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm an out and out liberal on the left on this. Uh, I hear the arguments in the other side and I do see a risk uh, in, uh, if we had no filibuster, uh, President Trump would have lot, gotten through a lot of things that I would not have liked. But I think we ought to be a democracy and take the risks of a democracy. 
And a democracy means to me, everybody gets to vote and the majority of the voters counted fairly uh, get to decide a lot of the big questions, including who our president is, who our state senator is and so on. So that's where I'd come out, Catherine, and I assume you would too, and probably most of our Ollie people. And those who are on the other side, write us, let us know. <laughs> Uh, okay. I, I love to engage in Gmail. Uh, I'm Tom Garrity at Gmail, and I love <laughs> to engage in arguments on that forum. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, there are some other questions with regard to indigenous rights. Uh, and um, although this isn't included in the questions and, and whether the indigenous um, and and whether the 19th Amendment impacted Indigenous women who fought for the 19th Amendment. Um, but um, the, some of the legislation that allowed people to vote had a definition regarding civilized Indians or Indians who were not. Yeah. Yes, and Indians who were not part of uh, reservation communities. So um, do you know whether there was a gendered uh, element on the impact of um, these laws with regard to um, the voting rights of Native Americans? I don't know the answer to that. It's a very good and interesting question. Uh, I do know, as Catherine knows too, and has just alluded, and, and many of our listeners may not, that the Civil War amendments, the women's suffrage amendments, all these things did not reach indigenous uh, Native Americans uh, in the bulk, unless in the, in, and it was an exceptional case subject to a lot of stringency, they were separated from their tribes and had, and this goes back to those, uh, we were just in Phoenix at the Heard Museum and the Indian boarding schools where people so again, immediately after the Civil War, people were seeking to separate young kids as young as five and so on from their family, their language, their culture, their religions, and turn them into good Americans, in quote. Uh, but no, indigenous American Indian voting required the congressional legislation. I think it's called Native, Native uh, American or the Indian Voting Act or something after in the 20s, after uh, women's suffrage. And my hunch is that statistically, very darn few Native Americans voted, male or female, previous to that. And we know, by the way, on all the issues we just, we just uh, discussed, or I just mentioned, rural living, distant voter registration, uh, difficulties with transportation, poverty, uh, credit cards or identity cards, on all those issues. Native Americans are among the most disadvantaged. So um, I, it'd be interesting to ask, and I don't know the answer, what statistically is their rate of voting male and female? It's undoubtedly going up in this surge, this civil rights movement reaching a kind of crest in reaction to President Trump's uh, cruelties and abuses. Um, but I don't have the good answers for you. Yeah, and I would just uh, respond, um, adding a little bit to that, that uh, some of the voting restriction uh, proposals in South Dakota, the, um, the reservation populations and the Native American populations in South Dakota have argued that those are specifically uh, to limit um, the voting of uh, Native uh, Native Americans. So that's an important, um, a very important issue. You know, uh, to that, let me interrupt and say, I did notice, and you may have too, that Lisa Murkowski was remarkably responsive to yes. Deb Holland's uh, confirmation as Secretary of the Interior. And that led me to ask myself the question, well, what percentage of Alaskan voters, eligible to vote at least, and maybe registered to vote, are indigenous, and the answer was 20%. So that's an extraordinary. In those states where the Native Americans make up a good hunk, and Alaska is probably the leading state in that regard, uh, they're getting listened to. Uh, and uh, similarly, I think in Hawaii and some other places, but it's, it's a very interesting question that you raised, Catherine. Yeah, and New Mexico and Arizona also have um, I believe the highest, among the highest percentages of Native Americans uh, that are citizens of those states. 
Uh, there are a number of questions raised uh, because of your comments at the beginning um, to the issues around Asian Americans. Uh, so there are a number of questions about laws as they affected Asian Americans. Um, and um, I would again just start out by pointing out that um, even though there were many Asian Americans uh, who fought for uh, the 19th Amendment, uh, in almost all cases, it didn't impact them. And Tom can pick the story up from that. Yeah, it, I mean, this is, you know, there have been several questions that have raised the uh, question, the interaction, if you will, between social views, including social prejudice and bigotry and laws. Uh, I, and I, I think that this, the Asian question on which I am certainly no expert uh, is an example of that. Uh, the tremendous struggle to uh, oppose the prejudicial view that the Japanese were loyal to the emperor and not to the United States, notwithstanding having been born here or immigrated long before. Uh, and then the tremendous uh, heroism, as with the black soldiers in the Civil War of the Japanese and other Asian soldiers in the Second World War, their high rates of death in battle and so on and so forth. The interaction between legal possibility, which in California by that time was, uh, had been liberalized and actual reality. I don't know the statistics, but my hunch that the prejudice pushed people back pretty hard and community leaders uh, along the analogous to Stacey Abrams in Georgia in the recent period had to really get out there and hustle to get people to feel confident about going in, showing, especially if they'd immigrated their papers or if they had to, or at least their residents and so on. So I'm not a good person to really go in any depth into this, uh, but I think it participates in the same matrix, namely uh, laws formally allowing certain things, entitling you to certain rights, uh, cross-cut by tremendous bigotry and prejudice and thus a cultural or social inhibition about pushing forward because it takes some guts or some courage and some will be hurt. Uh, and my impression of the history of California and Oregon and so on is it was just, it was awful, the deprivations on the almost analogous to the KKK in the South for black people. Uh, yes, there was, uh, there were laws in California that said that Japanese um, and Chinese children could not attend public schools. Um, it wasn't even separate but equal. It was just, they couldn't attend public schools, period. Um, and so there's a long history of, um, of um, laws, discriminatory laws. Uh, but on the citizenship question, um, uh, if, if you were Chinese or Japanese born in the United States, you could become a citizen. But um, uh, people coming from Japan or China could not be naturalized. Yeah. For many uh, years so, after exclusion acts, yeah. Yes, and so that was, uh, I mean, first they weren't supposed to come, but if they did come, they could not be naturalized. But their children, because of the 14th Amendment, and this was recognized in the legal case, could be um, considered citizens. And so eventually there were, um, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Asian Americans, men and women who were able to vote. Uh, but again, poll taxes and literacy tests were used uh, to prevent many of them, both men and women, uh, from uh, voting. And Catherine, maybe time. we should add, I mean, this may be going over ground that people are very familiar with, but the, the, this, the horror really, or the, the shame of the constitutional cases, Korematsu and so on, about the internment camps and the other uh, uh, curfews and other restrictions, because it wasn't just the internment camps. There were other restrictions of the sort that Catherine was saying. During the Second World War was one, that there was bigotry and prejudice put into presidential orders and government policy, but two, that the Supreme Court upheld those government policies. And as Justice Jackson said in dissent in the Korematsu case, uh, 
it's one, you know, that it's one thing for a policy to be prejudicial in wartime in emergency circumstances, to be bigoted. It's another thing for the Supreme Court to ratify it, as he said, such that it will lie about in constitutional law like a loaded gun ready to be used the next time. And that, that's a serious charge. And I, I, think, uh, I think we're beyond that. I don't think we'll be interning Americans in new emergencies, although the 2000, you know, the 9-11 crisis clearly led to injustices, uh, both to some citizens of Muslim background, but in particular to uh, students and residents here who are coming to work or to study. We had a lot of deportations simply because people were rounded up and interrogated and then were found to have minor infractions that uh, entitled the government to throw them out of the country. Okay, uh, Tom, I'm gonna end with uh, one question here um, that I think moves a little bit away from the uh, constitutional question, but it's sort of an interesting philosophical question. Uh, and uh, that is that Susan B. Anthony argued that political rights come first and after you're granted political rights, then you educate people. So the League of Women Voters and all of those things that um, um, happened uh, after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, argued that um, that women deserve the rights regardless of how they would exercise the franchise. And so um, more from a human rights perspective, not from a perspective that they're going to make the uh, political process better. So um, what do you think of that argument, which was very important um, for much of the um, suffrage movement? Yeah, and it, it's like the argument, if women were in charge, wouldn't governments behave better, right? Isn't it, doesn't it bear an analogy to that argument? And, you know, you have Indira Gandhi over there on one side saying, well, gee, she was a woman, she was pretty bad. Uh, but most of the men who are tyrants, as Abigail Adams said at the beginning of these talks, of this talk, uh, most of the men fill the ranks of tyrants, I have to say, or the ranks of tyrants, let me put that better, are mostly filled by males. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, Frederick Douglass clearly was arguing that we've got to get, black people are in desperate trouble. Jim Crow, slavery, the recent emancipation, uh, terrorism, uh, give us the vote and that'll help us get out of trouble. He was probably at first a little naive about how bad the trouble could, how much the trouble could persist even with a formal conferral of voting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great thing to ponder. I don't think I should try to answer it. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, women do seem to be better <laughs> at not losing their, not getting hijacked as Adelia says, as a psychological therapist. Um, but uh, you see the pictures of Boston and New Orleans and school segregation, you see those screaming faces and you know uh, you see the screaming faces at Trump rallies and so on. You know that people are getting hijacked from both sides of the, and, and, and I guess even from the middle of sexuality, you know, the sort of more queered or ambiguous uh, sexuality. So I have no view on this tough, tough question. <laughs> I guess I should retreat into <laughs> a kind of neutrality. Right, and we have a comment from one of the participants who says, I'm afraid these newest elected Republican women are blowing that argument out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's um, an, an important, um, I think, uh, and a good place uh, to close out um, today. Um, but um, I, I do want to acknowledge here we have people from 17 states besides Massachusetts uh, who are represented uh, today in the class. They're from all parts of the United States, east, west, north, south, um, um, some states in the middle. And so I think it's um, really good that we have that diversity of um, 
regions in this discussion because I think that will make it richer. So uh, for all of the people from uh, other parts of the country, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you will join us again next week. Uh, we do have um, our speaker next week is Barbara Berenson. Um, she, like um, Tom, is a lawyer. Uh, she is an attorney working for the Massachusetts um, uh, Supreme Court, our Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and, but she wrote a really wonderful book uh, on the neglected history of suffrage in Massachusetts. So next week, uh, we'll be digging a little more deeply into the history of suffrage in Massachusetts. And uh, we will um, then be um, showing how the work that was done here spread across the country, especially through the state ratification efforts. Um, so again, thank you uh, very much, Tom. Thank you for all of us who have, uh, all of you who have joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Have Thanks a great you. day, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. Get there, get out to Mount Shasta. Yeah. <laughs>